Now we'll talk about the motion that occurs at all different scales of existence. Each of these scales are thought of as dimensions in Haramain's model, and a whole video will go into this idea of scalar dimensionality. We have atoms, stars, galaxies, very different objects, but amazingly, and with a, a really nice intuitive feeling to it, we notice that each and every one of these vastly different sized objects behaves in the same manner. So I think the best way to get into it is by imagining a hurricane, it's something we're all familiar with. Very simply stated, a hurricane is formed when a high pressure area encounters a low pressure area, we get spin. Uh, when these pressures interact, they generate this spin, or torque. This is one of the basic things that happens in our universe. In Haramain's model, torque happens. Torque is a universal force like gravity. In relativity, space-time is described as curving inward toward gravitational bodies. You can imagine a bowling ball in the center of a trampoline. The closer we get to the bowling ball, the more curve. In Haramain's model, it not only curves, it curls. Like water going down a drain, this curling generates spin. The spin is inherent in the system, just as much as gravity is. We're going to look at what happens when that spin starts to move. In a hurricane, we see a huge density of energy and movement, but in the middle, you have what allows that movement to take place, a cold, still spot. It's called the eye of a hurricane. This is perfectly analogous to a black hole at the center of galaxy. So now let's think of a galaxy and think of the way it moves. We've got stuff spinning around this central black hole. The movement's allowed to exist in its full 3D form. In a hurricane, the entire interaction has to occur in this very thin layer of our atmosphere. The dynamic's the same, it's pancaked a little bit. In a galaxy, it looks like a model. We'll put a model up here and put it up on the screen. Particles come from the top and the bottom, spinning down the drain, as it were. As they get near the black hole, they're flung away out the central plane of the galaxy, similarly to the way we send space probes into deep space. We fling them around a planet to gain momentum and fling them out farther, faster, like a sling. This is the same thing that happens with stars in a galaxy. They come down toward the gravitational center of the black hole and are shot out toward the reaches of the galaxy. Eventually their momentum is overcome by gravity, which slows them down until, like a tetherball on a rope, it starts to swing around following the gravity pulling it. Now, on the outside skin of this dual torus, we have a very low density. You could think of this as low pressure. Then, as the stars move toward the center again, the density, of course, gets higher and higher. As this density gets higher and higher, we experience more gravity, more curling, and here we are spinning down the drain again. Then they're flung back out to the low density area. Now, look at this dynamic. What is there to stop this dynamic? Nothing, really. We have a hurricane that never goes over the land to peter out. We have a system that will generate its own torque for a very, very long time. The high pressure will always be there. The low pressure will always be there until this thing creates more matter than it can spin, at which point it would likely collapse upon itself like a star going supernova. That, of course, is also the same dynamic. So we, get, we have to kind of say, when I'm talking about creating matter, we have to ask ourselves, what, what is matter? What is that? And how does it get created? We'll go back to the first video where I was talking about continuous creation. How is it that the vacuum could be disturbed? By what mechanism? It's a good place to highlight some of these ideas. The vacuum is essentially a grid existing through space-time. That grid is space-time. It's basically a high-tension net of potential energy. And that's, we call it the ether, the vacuum, lots of names. But remember, 10 to the 94th grams per cubic centimeter. An enormous amount of energy waiting in this net. In the beginning, something happened, started moving this net. The net itself is a perfectly balanced equilibrium. But if that equilibrium is struck, if that equilibrium is set like a guitar string to vibrating, what is that? That vibration, 
That oscillation is what we call matter. That's what we call stuff. Essentially, all matter is, is movement. It's an oscillation. Everything that exists is spinning at a particular rate and flying through space. Just like a vibration on a guitar string, it, it can bounce back and forth and generates a really nice tone. In space, there's no bouncing back and forth. It's big. It can just keep going and going and going. So our entire planet worth of these small vibrations are all following a general trajectory, following the path of our star, following our star. So everything exists spinning at a particular rate. It's a three-dimensional wavelength flying through the ether at light speed. Matter is simply the potential energy of the vacuum vibrating. So what could vibrate that energy? What force could set that off? Well, clearly the Big Bang can vibrate that energy and do a whole lot of vibrating at that. Whole universe worth, right? Though it would only take a little, relatively speaking. It's a lot of energy. Well, let's, let's look at some other things. What else could cause that? Imagine a hundred billion stars being shot out the center of a galaxy, rounding the outside of the halo, compressing into a vortex at the top of the torus, causing all kinds of collision, all kinds of crazy stuff here, spiraling down this drain. At this point, things are rubbing against each other. There's a whole lot of friction. There's sheer force, major explosions, the likes of which the mind can barely even grok. Thermonuclear events happening. A lot of stuff that could disturb this. Now here's another little bone to throw in there too. Imagine a supersonic jet breaking the sound barrier. There are some great YouTube videos of this. I, I have lots of fun watching them. Uh, what you get is a wave front of sound. And the jet is catching up with the sound it's creating. So the sound is stacking up in front of the jet as the jet slowly inches through the sound barrier. As the jet moves through the speed of sound, the sound wave is released like a whip crack. You get a sonic boom. All of that compressed energy is released at the same time. A sonic boom, if it's too close to a city, will shatter every window. An incredible amount of pressure is stacked up when you move something through the sound barrier. Now, what happens if you accelerate matter faster and faster and faster and faster, moving toward a black hole, until potentially you could start to approach the speed of light? These are just some conjectures to throw out there and say, what could possibly disturb the vacuum? In Haramain's theory, this could be a, a viable source. If the vacuum was disturbed, we would get more oscillation of the ether, more matter. And bear in mind, it wouldn't have to be disturbed much. You know, If 100 million stars moving so fast, they begin to catch up with their own radiation, were able to disturb one single cubic centimeter of the vacuum, and look at the scale difference here, it would release enough energy to create several dozen universes. So what is to say, if that galaxy-sized phenomenon could vibrate the vacuum enough to disturb just one millionth of one cubic millimeter, it would probably be enough energy for the galaxy to grow at a very quick rate. So you can see here, Given these numbers, it's hard to imagine that the interaction could fail to happen. In fact, if it was not happening, it'd be a miracle, just looking at the odds of the thing. And there's more to it, too, because this interaction suggests a potential means to tap into this energy source. This is a very exciting video that's going to come later. You can start thinking about it now.